Okay, welcome to the last uh, session of the day. Uh, I would like first to also to wish you happy birthday, although it was <laughs> before. <laughs> I don't remember when we met. Uh, I it must be at seven, uh, maybe between 25 and 30 years ago. Yeah, late 80s. Uh, we're not, uh, although we had not collaborated together, always your papers will inspire me. <laughs> <laughs> and I must say that uh, at least we had a collaboration uh, in uh, European networks. <laughs> we were at four or five uh, uh, framework programs, something like that, about um, almost 20 years <coughs> of successful networks. So usually the correspondence that we had was to answer your questions about how to spend the budget, <laughs> how to move it, what are the rules for hiring <laughs> those dogs. So uh, I'd like to uh, have the first speaker of this session, Fernando Quevedo. Uh, <laughs> string models. Okay, well, thank you very much. So thank you, the organizers, for the inviting me for this uh, special occasion. For me, it's very, very important to be here. Actually, when they consulted me if I was going to be available, any, uh, which days I would be available to, to, to start planning the, the event, I told them that I could come at any time, even if it was uh, Christmas day or something. <laughs> <laughs> so because for me, Luis is very, very important in my career and as a friend. And uh, so I think this is a, a very well deserved uh, occasion for him. And I went, and it's an honor for me to be part of it. So uh, I will talk in principle about the uh, work that I've been doing together with uh, Michele Ciccoli, Sven Krippendorf, Christoph Menhofer, and Roberto Valandro. Uh, there's a paper that came out last year, and then one it is going to appear in the next couple of weeks, I hope. And, uh, but I think I will spend some time talking about my relationship with Luis since we met each other in 19. 86. Oops. Okay. <laughs> so Ana Maria took this. That's the problem of, of, of being one of the uh, last speakers because uh, I was getting nervous because everybody was going to use the photographs that I was having there. And I said, Ana Maria had exactly the same thought. So I wanted to talk about Luis strings on the landscape. So you can see <laughs> it's more or less here. And it's nice to see the Luis at this uh, level, together with what he became later on, giving here lectures in Princeton about uh, string phenomenology, I think, a few years ago. And, uh, but uh, uh, this photograph, going back to the, to, the, to the strings part, I haven't heard, actually, I haven't listened to this playing the guitar. I was told that he plays it, but also that he sings very similar to Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at least he makes it very close to Bob Dylan. And for me, it's, an, it's a nice uh, comparison because I, 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 I came up after several years of supervising students and learning from the way that we supervise students in the way to be as, as informal as possible and as uh, open and naive as possible. So I, I, keep st I kept saying that uh, I follow the Bob Dylan approach to supervising students. <laughs> <laughs> and the Bob Dylan approach is that since he sings so bad, everybody thinks that they can sing better. So he motivated many people to, to sing, <laughs> and to, to become a professional singers. <laughs> so I think when, this, when I, if I talk to a student and the student say, well, this guy made it to Cambridge, I'm sure I can, I can make it in my own career. So, <laughs> so anyway, so, so, and so, okay, so, so this is uh, Luis with some very famous company. Chiara, Chiara, Chiara Napi, yes. Yeah. Oh, I, know, yeah. I know Chiara, but I haven't seen her for many years. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, this is uh, also I am a streamer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a conformal problem. It's a conformal problem. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow. Just the spirit of being conformal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so let me tell you some highlights of my scientific experience. I'm a friendship experience with Luis. Uh, I went to the to the Inspires, and that's that's the famous 31 came out also as Ana Maria. Somehow it's an invariant for Luis, but I realized that Ana Maria ha has a 
the edge to me because then it says 30 of them are citable. <laughs> So for some reason, one of our papers is not citable. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know why. So anyway, so this is, uh, I can see uh, my record of papers with Luis. I think it's, it's actually uh, the average of the citations that you can see is very high. It's much higher than my uh, own average. So I can see um, my collaboration with Luis has been for the, the highlights of my career. So these are. But not that much, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. And so these are f uh, six of our uh, most cited papers, and I think we have you have heard some of about some of them. Probably about this one you haven't heard yet. So I will just go quickly through some of them that I has been mentioned. First, this is a, a collaboration that I appreciate very much. Uh, Luis and Peter, when I came to to CERN to Europe for my first postdoc, uh, I was coming from the United States. They took me as, as their collaborator immediately, and for me, it uh, was a very important uh, for, for the development of my career and for, 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 for learning how to do research in the way that they did it. And so I learned a lot from them, and I am very much thankful for all the things I have learned from them. And we were uh, together in a, few, in a conference a couple of years ago, and we took this nice picture. Somehow, it's also expanded. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, so and this coloration started in this paper, Orifice and Wilson lines. Uh, as you see, it appears in March in '87. So we finished it at the end of '86, and had arrived at CERN as a postdoc. It was my first postdoc in October '86. So we was immediately were working together, and we we wrote this paper that still people are uh, working and using the, the techniques that we developed at that time. <coughs> Some of the things that, for instance, Peter ma mentioned today, are uh, th th you can send them back to, to the, f the formalism that we developed at this time. Again, um, so, so this is, uh, I went to check for citations, and this is actually is my most cited paper. <laughs> but it is not Louis' most cited paper, not Peter. So I have a good explanation for that is that I'm younger. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, the other collaboration, which uh, I think Dieter already mentioned, and Maria also. This is uh, uh, the uh, collaboration that uh, gave us, uh, uh, we wrote two papers that Dieter already mentioned on the, on the T-duality and the other one on S-duality. So S-duality, I'll just go quickly because Dieter already mentioned it. But it's, uh, this is a paper we wrote in 1990. There are several things I can say about this paper. Uh, 1990, as you can remember, it was a World Cup. And I was uh, working in Los Alamos. Uh, Ana Maria had been visiting me before, uh, but Luis and, 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 and Dieter were in at CERN. So I just changed my working hours to work overnight, so to be at the same time as, uh, as uh, Europe. And I was watching the World Cup during the day. <laughs> So the secretary came to me at some point and said, well, I will write that you have been on holidays because I haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, at the end, I had to come out and show you her the paper. And uh, so this is a, also at that time, I was the only member of the collaboration without the permanent position. So I was very scared. No, I didn't have any permanent position at that time. No? no well, but it was, a very, was more permanent than I was. <laughs> 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 because you're a Heisenberg fellow, one of those things. Uh, some fellow, I think, still at that time. That's right? Yeah. OK, well, anyway, so I was nervous because this was the first paper I wrote in which there are very few equations. I know the equations follow from any other one. <laughs> <laughs> so that means that it was a, a lot of uh, speculations because it was just uh, undefined, this kind of symmetry. And I have to confess I, I was nervous about, about it. And I don't know if uh, the rest of the collaborations uh, remember, I suggested at some point that probably we can put it in the previous paper. And we say, no, no, this is very important thing. We should write a paper just about it because this is uh, important. I think uh, uh, he was completely right and I was wrong. And I think this, this is a, an important paper. And uh, Dieter mentioned some of the, the things that we use here, the 11 dimensional things and so on. The, uh, you would mention about uh, range type to eight and to B and heterotic and so on. And uh, that is 1990. And then, of course, the, the main the work of uh, everybody came in 1994, 95, uh, uh, but essentially this paper was an inspiration for that. And one way to, to prove that is that 
the words S-duality and T-duality were first used in this paper. So we introduced that terminology that everybody is using. So it's, even though people don't stop referring to us, it's a big pleasure for us to listen. Every, every, every time people say T-duality or S-duality, we know that we invented the terminology. So at least for, for, for word invention, we are happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is other collaboration that I wanted to mention. As you can see, each of us looks very similar as we look today. <laughs> even, <laughs> even, even we are, <laughs> we are dressed in the same way. <laughs> okay. And the reason that the, we took the photograph a few minutes ago, and uh, thank you to Fernando and Paolo who helped, uh, so we, I can show it. That, that, that showed that I was so nervous that I wasn't going to show any photograph that was the original, so this is, and this is a collaboration. It's, it's called the bottom-up approach. And we're trying to see the bottom up <laughs> <laughs> somehow. <laughs> and, uh, and so there is this paper, the deep brains at singularities, a bottom up approach to the string embedding of the standard model. Again, this was in the year 2000. And I said, so we, just said we, we, were propo we proposed this uh, uh, way that we, we call, well, we call bottom up in the sense that, that we can, as a technique for model building in string theory, you can just separate uh, local issues and then, and then, then, then uh, um, forget uh, and, and separate the questions in several stages. So the local cases, things like, like uh, um, the brain power where the standard model lives and the model stabilization and everything which is global to separate the, uh, the issues and then that's a technique to simplify and do model building. Uh, also in, in this paper I have to say that people don't appreciate. We also have, if it isn't written here in the abstract, you can see a theory word here. So we actually had a concrete F theory model local and supersymmetric. In the, in the year 2000, which is uh, before all this new fashion of F-theory model building that happened in the last uh, three or four years. And uh, it is inspired by this paper that I will refer to the rest of my talk. So I, I will be more explicit to what, what uh, let's say, so model building. Uh, this uh, slide I also introduced very quickly this afternoon because I was having lunch with Raul Rabadan, who is, I don't know if he's around here, yeah. Raul is, as you may know, is a big star in, in, in biology. Uh, he was working in stream model building for years, as uh, one of the students of, of, uh, of Luis. And when we were talking about what we were working on, he made me feel bad because he said, I'm doing the same thing that I was doing 10 years ago, whereas he has been discovering new viruses and so on. <laughs> so somehow, I said there has been some progress somehow. And this is, uh, in the past 10 years we have made some progress in uh, model building and the local way that I told you, and the global, as Peter was mentioning. Also some calculability. People can compute number two effects and so on. And model stabilization. And that has given rise to the famous landscape, inflation from string theory and so on. So there has been a lot of progress in the last uh, few years. And of course, Luis has been participating in all of it. So this is the idea of the, lo uh, of the lo local models. So the local models is that we can just have, assuming that the brain, we live at the, at the, uh, in the standard model list of the brain, located in the, in the Calabi uh, At some point, the important thing is where this brain is located in the extra dimensions and separate from what happened to the rest of the extra dimensions. The extra dimensions can be many Calabi with different topologies and holes and so on, but many of the questions can be asked only at the local part, and that's where, where, where we will be living. <coughs> At some point, uh, as, a, uh, as a parenthesis of this, I was asking myself, uh, you know, I learned so many things from Luis since we started working together. I was asking, what is it that he has learned from me? And uh, I couldn't find anything, at least in physics, zero. <laughs> but uh, I think I taught him how to do draw, do the uh, X fig. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is that uh, I was doing some drawings for one of the papers, he asked me, oh, I have some ideas for so, some drawings. And I told him, sorry, Luis, I have to teach the next couple of days. I won't be able to do any drawing for me. But you can do this. Go to XFIC and this <laughs> click these things, and you can start doing The next day, we had uh, so many figures made by Luis. <laughs> and so he became an expert on, on XFIC. So at least I, I can say that I, I taught him that. And I don't know if Luis made this one or, or Angel or, or uh, sorry? It's Angel, I guess. Eh? Yeah, it's not mine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So. Right. <laughs> yes. So anyway, so th that's the idea of, the, of this picture. So th this is important. Please, please keep it in mind. 
separate the local issues. So here you can have a non-compact space or whatever from the compact space. And uh, having both Luis and Peter in the room, it, uh, I have to tell you that uh, some people claim that, uh, that uh, we in string theory, string theory, we all follow each other, and it's only the outsiders who have to force us to, to, to be honest with, uh, with what we do. Uh, but it's not true. I mean, the most critical part that we have is our own colleagues. And for this part, I think uh, Peter has been very critical, and I, rec I agree with him, because uh, he said, well, you have a model here. It's not a string model until you do the whole thing. And uh, on the other hand, Luis was behind the, 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 this idea together with Angel and Gerardo and myself about separating the two issues. And uh, so I won't be able to satisfy both of them, <laughs> but I, I will try. My guess is that my effort today, even though it is uh, uh, as, uh, the event in honor of Luis, is that uh, I think Peter will be happier than Luis uh, at the end of my talk. I hope. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Okay. So the bottom-up approach. So essentially, we separate issues between local issues and global issues. So local is uh, have the gauge group. The color spectrum, three families, and so on. You cover couplings, gauge couplings, proton stability, flavor issues. Everything can be asked. All these things, which are very important, are only local issues. What happened in the singularity at, at, at the brain, and uh, so <coughs> uh, you can separate it from other questions, which are usually more complicated. The stabilization of the model, the shape and, and size of the extra dimensions, the cosmological constant, the supersymmetry breaking, all the scales the scale of unification, the actions, the, the, the SUSI breaking scale, and so on. Uh, the cosmological issues, inflation, reheating, the cosmological model, the problem, and so on. These are very difficult questions. And uh, the idea of this bottom-up is just a simple, it's a technique to simplify our lives, that to address these issues here. And then once we address them here, address them address parallel, in parallel these issues, and at the end of the day, put them together. So that's, that's the difficult part, putting them together. But each of them, it's difficult enough to separate them, because otherwise, you start with the model. If you have to do everything with the single model. If it doesn't work, you, start, you have to start again, and so on. Whereas here, it's a systematic way to, do, uh, to solve some of the questions by one class of models, and then some of the issues, and then at the end, put them together. So for the model stabilization, I have been working a lot for the last 10 years on this. So today, I won't spend that much on that. Except that uh, it has been one of the, the, the major um, um, successes in the last few years of, of, about model stabilization, in particular in type 2b, just fixing the size and the shape of the extra dimensions in terms of fixing the size of four cycles and three cycles. And I have been working on, on a particular scenario, which is called the large volume, where for which it so happens that by doing a standard techniques of model stabilization, we have a volume to be exponentially large. And that is nice. Because if you have a large volume, then the standard model has to be localized. So the idea that I was telling you that we were using the localization of the standard model as a technique to simplify our life, this one will tell you in, in the model that we are working on, which is the type 2B string theory, the standard model has to be localized. The idea is probably I can just tell you more about this, the story. Imagine this is the Calabria. And uh, you have one of the cycles is exponentially larger than the rest. And that comes out of the calculations. It's not that we are imagining. That's, that's the outcome. And if what is it, our, our brain cannot be a brain wrapping this large cycle, why not? It cannot be because the gauge coupling is the inverse of the size of the cycle. So the cycle is exponentially large. The gauge coupling will be exponentially small. And it will be unrealistic. So they cannot have, I mean, we know the gauge coupling cannot be that, that small. So we have the gauge coupling has to be, uh, our brains have to be wrapping a small, relatively small cycle. And this is the, the famous Madrid uh, model, just as, as an as a, uh, illustration, that uh, you have to, to be wrapping a relatively small cycle. Than, and, and, and then if you wrap a small cycle, that means that the model is localized. And then the localization is something that is, is, is welcome in this model stabilization. Okay. And for that, as I told you, that there are several ways to study the, the localization. Brains at similarity that I would refer to magnetized design brains that uh, Luis and colloidators have been working on for years, and then these local left theory models. I will just concentrate on the brains of singularities. So the brains of singularities, the, our orig original papers, we concentrated mostly on orbifolds, uh, similar to the heterotic case, but in, the, in this, uh, the, in this, uh, this is type 2b. 
this can be generalized to classes of singularities. Probably the most uh, famous ones is called del peso, go to zero to n. Del peso are, are just essentially the shape of some of the four cycles within the Calabellado. <coughs> and they have a special property that can, you can be collapsed to a single point. And that makes them special because then you can, you can actually think about localization if you work in the del peso. And are, this is a very nice mathematical structure. They are P2 blow up at n points and they are only uh, up to from zero to eight del peso surfaces. They have to have a positive stern class and so on. And then, but of course, there are larger classes. For instance, there's a toric singularities, which is for which there are infinite classes of models. Here, I'm talking about the non-compact versions, the non, the, the ones uh, just local, not, not not the whole compact calabellados. And so, in there, we can put the the brains. And then, the nice thing is that the the structure of the model can be studied in a very simple way in terms of what is called a quiver diagram. This is the simplest one, del peso zero, which happens to be equivalent to the Z3 singularity. And if I put one brain here, two brains there, and three brains there, then we have a U1 cross U2 cross U3, and you have the standard model Gilgate group. And then this quiver diagram has a kind of a dual kind of version called a dimer diagram, from which you can start do doing this, this uh, funny zigzag uh, figures here. And this, whenever you have a closed loop, that tells you a coupling that, you, that is allowed, so you can get the superpotential like, automatically from, from, from the structure of the model. So it is very calculable, so you can calculate things very well. Uh, it's very, understood, very well understood, and you can calculate things. The, as I say, the simplest case is del peso zero. Here we have n1, n2, n3, uh, the, this, this, the, these three brains. But you can have, if the, all the ends are different from each other, you, you need to have extra stuff, which will be these seven brains, which I put them here with uh, these extra uh, wide circles. Uh, that, uh, and the number of them will be M1, M2, M3. And uh, the number of them are going to be constrained by, I'd say, anomaly cancellations, just to simplify, essentially by tadpole cancellation in string theory. They give you some constraints that if you fix the ends, the number of these three brains, you can have here the standard model of left right symmetric and of Patti Salam and so then you have to cal cal calculate what, what are the values of the m's, m1, m2, and m3. <coughs> Keep this in mind because this is an important part of, of my talk. At the moment, you have two, two equations here. You fix n1, n2, n3, you have three m's, so you are left with one free parameter, which is one of the n's, completely free. So you can have infinite values of these seven brains added there that are allowed locally. And so we have examples. This is uh, the standard model case, as I told you, one, two, three. And then you have uh, three plus M, M, and six plus M, these seven brains. The same thing with the left right symmetric model, U3 cross U2 cross U2, and uh, practice a lamb, U4 cross U2 cross U2, and the trinification models. These ones are, are interesting because here's something we cannot get, and this is a prediction that some people don't like it. The prediction is that we cannot get grand unifi unified models here. Period. You cannot get. I mean, you, you can get SU5, but SU5 cross something, or SU10 uh, SO cross something. So, uh, so, so th that's not that bad in the sense that. Uh, but on the other hand, since the brains are a singularity, all the gauge couplings are the same. So you what would you want? You are you want to argue in terms of uh, unification? Then this is as good a unifi unified model as an SU5 or SO10 because they are all the brains at the same l l point, and the gauge coupling is the same, for, even though. You have three different gauge groups. The gauge coupling is the same in this case. And so this one, for instance, the Patti Salam, has, is beautiful because it has the, the states here are, you know, this is four, two. These are eight states, and there are another four, two. This is, and then the three arrows means the three families. So you have three families of uh, four, two, one, plus four, one, two. And that's precisely the 16 of SO10. So in that sense, you have the three families of SO10 here, all very old with the uh, unification. And this one is like a 27 was of, of E6, you know, 331 plus 33 three bar 1, etc. in the terms of SU3 cube, that will be a 27 of, of, S, of E6. So this one phenomenologically is as good as essentially the 27 of E6, or this one is as good as a 16 of SO10, uh, in the sense that you get unification and everything together. And it's a very, very, very simple kind of class of models. The DP series, since I told you you can compute, and actually you can compute the superpotential, 
And in general, you can find immediately that you have the eigenvalues of the masses are two degenerate eigenvalues and one zero. And that's very bad. It's bad because then you, you know the hierarchy in the standard model, we need different masses for, for the, so the, the first generation, second generation, and third generations. And this one, two are heavy and one is zero, so that doesn't work. However, we go to the more, uh, <coughs> to the, this is the simplest kind, the peso zero. You go to the peso one, instead of a triangle, the diagram is a square. And once you have that, you compute the mass matrix, and it's one big, one small, and one zero. That's perfect for the three generations. Okay. And this so happens that this is generic. This happens to all of them. So the bad case is the peso zero, and all the other ones, you can see the hierarchy, which is good. Yes? No, three, ho three copies of everything. Three, at least. Yes, and in the DP, in DP0, it's clearly that you have three because everything comes with three arrows. In the DP1 and so on, the, the arrows are just given, depending on how you get, you uh, hix the different <coughs> gauge groups, then you can get rid of them. But usually you have more, more hixes than one, more than one pair. That's, 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 a, that's a good point and that, that's because it's, it's difficult to get rid of it in general. I, I, I will go further, but now that you mention it, uh, in this case, this little right symmetric model, this what happens with, with the three Higgses and the, the normalization of the new ones that you can compute, you, can, you cannot play with it. You put the two things together, you get unification essentially as good as the SU5 unification. It doesn't happen for the standard model case. And this happens to be the model that we had in our original paper with the Gerardo, Angel, and Luis. And I think it's in, it made it all the way to the book, if I remember. <laughs> okay. so, so keep this model in mind because it's very interesting. Okay, so and then you have the del peso. This is del peso one, and you can have you can have the same thing. You have three, two, one. You have a, like the standard model with an extra u one, and then you give a vector to this field. The quadra the, the square becomes a triangle, and you get back the del, del peso zero essentially. So, you, and that's, and, and so, so you have this two two. You give a vector, and you get the, the the model that I was telling you before, except that you you now have the right hierarchy of, of masses. And it so happens that that uh, you can go to del peso one, two, and so on. The peso from, from uh, the peso four on is more complicated because you have three parameters that you cannot control. The peso three happens to be a nice compromise. It's the one that you have you don't have three parameters, and in that, to uh, address your question, uh, so it's, it's um, you can see now there is only one arrow in each case. There are no three arrows in the previous case. So in some sense, depending on how you do the Higgsing, you may have a hope to to give mass to some of the Higgses and not to all, to not to all of them. So. But, uh, but in general, uh, Alberto's question is, 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 is always good to, take, uh, to keep in mind. And then this is rich enough. Having the different, uh, dif uh, different generation for different arrows also allows you to have a richer structure for flavor. And from here, you can get uh, kind of a this good structure for the CKA matrix, for instance, and, and for, for the neutrino sector also, and so on. Uh, so in that sense, del peso 3 happens to be better than del peso 2, 1, and 0. And uh, that's good for model building, but also it will, it will be good to extract general information. So what is it that kind of general information you can extract from all these models? And uh, one is that you have usually flavor symmetries and they're approximate, which is good. Something that, that is interesting is that you, have, you can compute the maximum number of families, it happens to be three, for all these toric singularities, which I told you before, there were an infinite number of them. And the maximum number of families happens to be three, which is the physical one. So that's an interesting uh, result. Knowing that in many other constructions it's very complicated to, to, to have a limit to the number of families. The hierarchy, as I told you, is generic. And usually, since there will be, you have an extra overall volume where it's big, there will be a D7 drop in that cycle. The, weak coupling, the coupling of that D7s are, will be very weak. So there will, be, there will be, on top of the standard model interactions, there will be some hyperweak interactions, much weaker than, than, than the, the standard model interactions. So that's something to keep in mind. That's a difficult thing. We went through the whole process, so you have to see all the structure. And you see the quivers. One easy way to show why we thought it was going to happen. You go to any quiver written in the literature, you don't see more than three arrows. So the start question, is that generic? So then we went to some construction in terms of the dimer, uh, uh, diagrams made by, by Gulotta, which is a student in Princeton. 
and we follow his algorithm, and then we're able to prove by complicated uh, arguments that at the end you don't get more than three, except for one case, and that case has four, and but has that's a, that has a cyber dual which has less than three. So that was the only exception, which is, is, is I think, is very. No, 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 no. It's, it's in the completely independent because this is not. Uh, this is the case for uh, precisely before compactification, just the non-compact case. So this all toric, all what people call toric singularities, they have this property. So this is very, very general. Okay, so in the next three minutes, I will start with the origin, original part of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the, 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 the soil I told you the, with the Chico Liga Prickipendorf and et al. And the idea here is just, I told you that uh, we started local models in the non-compact case, and at the end of the day, we have to embed it into something compact. And that was, Peter keeps giving us very hard time over the last 10 years. So at the end of the day, I don't believe you unless you have something in mean, real Calabellar where you do it. So that's what we did. So we have been <laughs> doing now embedding this in the real compact Calabellar. And uh, this ugly picture was not done by me, so I don't. So at the end, we, we what we have is, to, for instance, we want to have a DP0, the peso zero I told you. If I have the peso zero singularity, and usually you have an oriented for you have to have a, a, ver, a image of it. So you have to look for a Calabellar, which has some particular properties that two del pesos are the same, that they can be ma mapped to each other, otherwise uh, uh, the, the you, will net, you will not get the UN groups. And then there will be here what is called an orientifold involution. You have to have a sector where you have Gagino condensate to fix the model. It's, it's, it's a complicated request. And we asked that question out of the tables. The, there's a classification of Calabellaos or toric uh, geometries uh, from Kreutzer and Skarke. And uh, out of uh, uh, the ones with the four and five uh, four cycles, which are the, the minimum that we can get. Out of, uh, say, 6,000 models, we started imposing some constraints that were just to have something realistic, to have the two del pesos, something to have the, the fix the model, and so on. And we got a couple of hundred. So it's not, even though we thought we were going to impose too many requests, at the end, 200 or 6,000 satisfy all the requests. So this is a way of eliminating models. And out of those, so we can start studying some of them particularly. And we took the simplest one, which is the one we has that has del peso zero. This is a, a way to construct the Calabellao in terms of you start with eight complex dimensions and you put some four constraints that reduce to four, cons uh, four dimensions. And then you impose a, a polynomial equation that re reduces the four to three, and that's a Calabellao. And you do this orientifold twist and so on. And, and then be able to construct a Calabellao that looks like the one that I was drawing here. And, uh, and with precisely these properties. And then we can. On top of that, ask some consistency checks, like uh, you have uh, you have to cancel all tadpoles. There's something called the free with anomaly, k theory charges, and so on. Everything has to be canceled, and everything is satisfied. So we get an honest to God uh, compact model where you have uh, the, the 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 brains of the singularity. More than or further than that, since we we put as a as a request to to have a, a particular cycle where we can have non-perturbative effects, they precisely allow you to fix the moduli, and you get moduli, all moduli stabilized in this size. So you not only have a compact Calabellao, but you have moduli stabilization in something where, uh, with realistic matter and so on. So that we did, uh, that's the content of the, of the paper we wrote last year, but we were able to do it only when you have only D3 brains. Remember in the previous slides, I had D3s and D7 brains. The D7 brains were more complicated, so we left it for later, and later is now. So now, so that's the paper that was going to come up in the next few days is where we did the D7 brain cases. We embedded the, uh, again, DP0 to be the simplest one, and you put the three M's, and then we found some things which were interesting for us, which is the following. I told you that we had the number of D7 brains. There were three arbitrary numbers, M1, M0, and one M2, and the two constraints coming from, say, the anomaly cancellation, say, and then that left one single parameter that I would call m, and we had m gone to any number, any integer number. That was a perfectly well consistent local model. So what is it that we found? That in the simplest, I mean, that, that, that n, if you want to make the embedding compact to make it consistent, this n cannot be arbitrary, but it has to satisfy this constraint. In particular, for the cases that we consider n1, n2, and n0 to be the same, this n has to be zero. So you cannot, you cannot add any D7 brains to the model you have. For instance, to the trinification model, three, 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 
you cannot add any design brain to make a, co a consistent global model. So that's a very strong constraint. If they are different, then you can add very few, and the few is, 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 is very, very, very few, because it's constrained by these numbers. So usually there's differences of order one, so this m is, uh, has to be negative and less than three, and so it's, it's very, very, very restricted. So all this infinite number of models that we have essentially co collapse to very few models, which is, which is good. So it's a global church constraint. Essentially, that, 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 that this seven brain comes out of the singularity, it has to wrap other cycle about. And then to make that wrapping that uh, consistent, then you have to have this, this constraint. That, I think, it was not observed before. Uh, because, I mean, because people, people were not doing this, this in the co compact cases. Uh, the other thing we found, which is also surprising, is that all of those models that I was showing you, they were completely independent models. You know, 322, 321, 333, and so on. Each model was independent from other ones, and they had completely different phenomenology and so on. Then, by doing this embedding, we realized that they were all connected to each other in a way that we were surprised. In the sense, for instance, we have 333 three, three here. There are not these seven brains attached to them, as I told you, but there are these seven brains wrapping other cycles to cancel all tadpoles. This is, this uh, uh, lines here are the, the, the oriented fold, and these are four, four uh, these seven brains that have to be wrapping the other cycles. And these three sets of threes are these three sets of threes here. And I put this one in red because at some point you can uh, move one of these uh, these sevens here toward the singularity, and you can get this. You get it here. So here, then move toward the singularity. Now you have only three instead of the four. But this one, when it goes to the singularity, is split into two. One of them annihilates with one of the singularity because surprisingly, one of the the brains inside the singularity they carry some of them carry negative deep brain charge, so they carry something like an anti-brain charge. So when you have a, you bring a brain there, they just annihilate with part of it. And the other one gets attached to the singularity. So, so in that sense, you can move from this model to this model. And then when this one to the 3, 2, 2, so you have the trinifications and the left-right symmetric, they are connected to each other, which is something surprising. As I told you, before they're doing their compact embedding, they were completely separated from each other. And, uh, and you can continue all over until you f you are, you're running out of these four uh, uh, brains, and then you go, for instance, to the 3, 1, 1. So you start from 333, three, you get all the way from 311. Of course, we started speculating that 311 happens to be the standard model after making SU2, but I don't know. <laughs> but of course, but there are many other possibilities. And uh, another curiosity, I'm sorry, this is something, something, something wrong happened to this slide. This was supposed to be a three, and these three arrows should be together here. So if you have 333, three, three, it is well known for many years you know, from the moment we, point where we wrote our paper with Luis and Angel and Gerardo, that if you have three, 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 there is a flat direction where you can take one brain out of here, another brain out of here, another brain out of here, and move it out to the bulk and make it into a two, two, two. That's a flat direction that you have, that you can move three, well, they're called fractional brains. You move them out of singularity, become one brain in, in the bulk. Uh, however, what we have found by these transitions is that you can just not move the all of them together, but we can move them one at a time. The three, three, three becomes three, two, two, and then you have one and one there, and then this three you can move. You can then this two combine and give you a three, one here, and then one you can this one and that one they can re recombine and give you this. So you can go step by by three steps, going from here to here in a different way. So there are different flat directions. So essentially, there was a flat direction to move one of the brains out of, uh, uh, out of the singularity by itself into this combination of, of, of the sevens and, and the threes. So all these things are giving us two things. Essentially, that the, no, the inf infinite number of, of models that we have when we have uh, brains of singularity reduced to very few. And those very few are all to be connected to each other, which is very surprising. So conclusions. So as you see, there's a continuous progress in local stream models, and there are some of them getting closer and closer to realistic. Uh, I didn't mention about supersymmetry breaking, but there are several supersymmetry breaking scenarios, depending on how you do the model stabilization. And the local models, once you have the global embedding and model stabilization, which is highly non-trivial to have the two things together, have a real uh, global model and at the same time stabilize the model with, with matter in, in, in the uh, in realistic uh, and couplings and so on, it was a, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a bus big challenge, but it has been done step by step, as suggested in our paper 10 years ago, uh, 13 years ago. And uh, then we got this to surprise that most local models don't, do not allow a global embedding. 
that's what I mentioned at the beginning before that I was expecting F uh, Peter to be happy because I think this is something that Peter has been uh, in, in, uh, emphasizing and it's actually happening. And also surprise for us is that those that are consistent, they form like a web of models that were supposed to be disconnected and now they are connected to each other. Interesting, I would always like to emphasize that in all these constructions with model stabilization and brains and so on, we have been using essentially all the known, uh, most I would say, known ingredients that we know that have to be there have been used. And the more we use, you get closer and closer to something realistic. So before people were using the geometry only to get calabillaos and we're not doing fluxes. That's very unnatural because the fluxes are there. So you, you don't put fluxes that you set out of an infinite number of possibilities, you're setting the ones to zero. Once you turn on the fluxes, what happens? The model are getting stabilized. So in that sense, something that you were neglecting, once you turn, you turn them on, something happens, which is making the model more realistic. The brains, you have to put all the brains that you can to see where you have the standard model, and you have only the three, so only the seven doesn't work. You put the three and the sevens, you get something more realistic. You have all, to get all the things that we get, we need not only tree level, but perturbative corrections to effective field theory, and they play a crucial role. And then non-perturbative effects also play an an crucial, a very crucial role to get everything to work. So at the end, everything that we know can be done has been done, essentially all, and each of them is allowing you to get something closer and closer to something realistic. And of course, as usual, progress has been made, but many, many questions are, are open. And so let me just uh, finish with this. So uh, you can see, this is Luis. <laughs> so this is another landscape, it's different from the one that he was playing the guitar. Uh, so I, I, I think, well, you can see several aspects of this landscape. Here's a rel relatively flat part. It's good for inflation. <laughs> but on the back of, his, of him, there is something that looks very close to one of the singularities I was showing. <laughs> so he may just turn around and, have a <laughs> and look that there may be something there. So having said this, I, I want to finish saying that you know, for me it's essentially impossible to overemphasize how, much, how important this has been for my career. And I thank you very much for all you have been doing for me. I have learned not only physics, but uh, any, uh, many, many things. I, I consider Luis like a wonderful, like a, you talk to an older brother, even though he's not that much older than me. <laughs> uh, whenever I have a problem, I can call Luis, what do you think about this? And uh, he always gave me wise advice. And we have been built a friendship with Carmen and the children. We have been seeing the children growing. They have seen our children growing, although not that much because they're very short. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a privilege for me to have shared so many things with Luis, and I really thank you for that. And wish you the best for the next 60 plus plus year. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>
Oh, very good. Yes, it's, uh, we're working in the framework. It's, yes, it's very well. This uh, thank you for the question. It is type 2B, type 2B with fluxes that is conformal to the Calabi Yau. So within that framework, this is general. But not exclude other products, possibly, no. where you can do Yes, up absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yes, but I mean that, yes. I, I will put as a challenge to you, because <laughs> I will not do it. <laughs> but, uh, yes. From the local perspective, I don't see any maximum. Yes, you can, you can start adding. For, uh, for, um, for in, the, in the compact, in the, in the global embedding, there's this issue that, uh, you know, to, to the, the picture I was showing with the four D sevens close to the, sing to the singularity. So you can start with any number of, of brains that you, you can put at, at the singularity. And uh, uh, if, since there are the three brains, you don't expect that much of a problem for, for back reaction and so on. So in principle, you can add that many as, as, as I think is correct. Uh, and, uh, um, but usually, you can take them, are, uh, three of them out of the singularity at a time. So usually people say there's a flat direction, so you can, the natural thing is essentially everybody disappears. However, since this is combined with model stabilization, model stabilization at the end give you uh, soft terms, and soft terms will give you uh, some uh, phi square contributions, uh, like a mass term for the scalars. So that flat direction is lifted. And so you can think that uh, this con each conservation say 333 three, three, may remain 333, three, three, and then you break it from uh, by other races. So in that sense, you could have started with uh, n, 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 and, uh, and I don't see any, any, any contradiction for that. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay, let us uh, thank uh, Fernando.